everyone, my name is Josh and this is Women's Call and Interesting Musings and Happy New Year everybody. I'm really happy that, you know, everyone's um, having a good time and I hope, you know, 2030, um, 2023 is a good year for all of you and wish Happy New Year to my family, he and all my friends as well and I hope you're all having a wonderful New Year's Day and relaxing and enjoying yourselves and I'm just going to be giving you a review for the Christmas special of Inside Number 9 and this Christmas special is called The Bones of St Nicholas and um, this particular episode is set in a church in a pew, the pew of number 9 and it basically follows a group of three people, four of you if you include the caretaker, excuse me, I'm a bit bunged up today so I do apologise if I sound a little bit groggy but um, this episode follows three people, four of you count the caretaker, um, Dick, played by Simon Callow. And um, this entire episode basically focuses on these four people in a church on Christmas Eve, telling ghost stories while the winter night just continues to proceed. We are introduced to the main, <coughs> We're introduced to the main character of um, Jasper Parkway played by Steve Pemberton, who is there under very mysterious circumstances. He doesn't... It's kind of, you know, very ambiguous as, as to what he's actually doing there. In some cases, he's very um, much going there for the sake of his wife. He says to the caretaker that he's pretty much, you know, there to honour the memory of his wife because she booked this champing trip, which is camping in a church, which is actually a real thing, by the way, if you don't know. So that's actually a very interesting thing that I found out throughout this entire odyssey of seeing this episode. It was more, you know, me finding out, oh, champing's a real thing, and it's actually really interesting. So, oh, yeah, that was that was an interesting um, tidbit. But, yeah, um, he says to the caretaker, Dick, that he is there for the legacy of his late wife. She passed away and she booked this trip before they passed away. So in order to honour her memory, he's just kind of there as sort of like a courtesy, sort of like to honour their marriage or something like that. And then he meets Posey and Pierce, plays, played by Shibna Gulati. Shibna Gulati. Um, I'm sorry if I pronounced that name wrong. Um, she was the... Um, she, she, she's a very good actress, and she um, was in Coronation Street. She played Zanita in uh, Coronation Street, and she was also in the Victoria Wood comedy, the um, Dinner Ladies as well. So she, she's a very good actress. She's very funny, and she plays um, Posey, who is the wife of Pierce. And they seem like a very charming couple. Oh, and it's And it's very kind of interesting, because usually when these sorts of characters are introduced... Mostly in Inside Number 9, these characters are introduced as kind of a little bit of an annoyance, but they're also kind of really charming. It's kind of the same principle here, where you kind of think to yourself, they're only annoying to one person, and that's the main protagonist, who is um, who is Jasper Parkway. And they seem very not... They seem very, you know, kind of strange, like Pierce is kind of one of those people who says things like, oh, he, you know, says kind of like an alcohol-based the Lord's Prayer kind of thing. He also, you know, describes a Christmas tree as looking like the Grinch's cock and um, various other things. And that particular one was actually really funny to me. I actually burst out laughing when I heard that. But, um, but Posey is actually one of these characters who I feel is the more quieter, the more, you know friendly and oh would you like a, a a towel to have with you as a pillow when you're you know lying down in the pews at night and things like that but she's very generous and very considerate and it's very interesting because you think why would she marry someone like pierce if he's kind of like this loud obnoxious kind of very you know loud and almost kind of rude um individual so you're kind of thinking to yourself how could these two characters come together but then as the story goes on we find out why through the form of stories. The first story we hear comes as the cur through the courtesy of um, Jasper Parkway, who is telling the story of the original um, St Nicholas, who was a bishop who was kind of a bit of an avenger because Pierce 
describes him as asks the question well what's his origin story and posey goes he's not a superhero love and he goes oh well he was a bit of an avenger of sorts or he um he was a bishop but he also you know helped save these boys from being horribly butchered by a butcher who was planning on killing cutting them up and serving them as meat to the local villagers but sadly it wasn't just a simple case of them getting free he had to change them back via magic or some sort and it's actually a very disturbing story it makes you kind of look at christmas ornaments in a complete christmas tree ornaments in a completely different light and it's also a really kind of darkly funny um um particular episode as well um dick is played by simon callow who like i said before is a very well-known actor and he tells the story of um a night where he was in the church alone and he swore on his life that he could see the apparition of a ghostly figure hooded in red and he believes that this is the ghost of saint nicholas who he saw in one of the pews one of the confessionals in a dark shroud with nothing but bit piercing eyes and a long black tongue but no mouth no jawline so his jaw was missing and it, it all kind of culminates to the idea that oh the jaw must be somewhere in this church and it's a fantastic um story it's very well told simon callow re performs it with a certain degree of atmosphere a degree of a commanding presence but this is Simon Callow. He's a guy who literally knows how to perform. He knows how to give these one-man shows, these very intense monologues. So he literally has to have a voice that commands your attention. And he does that very well with this particular technical story. And so does Steve Pemberton. Steve Pemberton and and Simon Callow were perfectly cast in these roles because they really do feel like they can carry the they can carry the entire thing on just their voices alone. I mean, this would be a wonderful radio play in the sense that you're basically just hearing these voices talk and communicate and they're voices that you recognise and they're voices that you feel could actually carry a story on just their voices alone. And I think that's just something that's really incredibly well done in this particular episode. It is, it is very atmospheric and it has a lot of very wonderfully bright lit moments, but then it, it gives off... The location of this particular um, story is a church and churches are meant to be very welcoming, very kind of holy, very lovely, and very warm. You, f you feel very warm stepping into a church, even if you're not particularly religious, you always feel this sense of warmth, like this, this real sense of safety behind you. But then it also has this element of being quite creepy as well. So it manages to toe the line between being very dark and very creepy to being very, you know, holy and very warm and very inviting. And that's a very hard um, balance to strike. And I think the creators behind this show did a very good job of trying to capture that. What I really think is very impressive about this show is it's, this particular episode in particular is it mostly relies on oral storytelling. And another property that I feel does this very well, that I think this um, particular episode lifts from is John Carpenter's The Fog in regards to how characters use oral storytelling to kind of get you into this sense of wrapping you in this sense of security or this little bubble of escapism until the penny drops. And that's something that was brilliantly utilised in the film The Fog, where um, Nick Castle is telling a story to Jamie Lee Curtis's character, Elizabeth, about a gold coin that he was, that his father found washed up on the beach. It, was, it, it went from a piece of driftwood into a into a coin and he put the coin in his in the breast pocket of his jacket and he went to go and give it to nick and then it was just gone and that i thought was a very interesting um story in itself but the fact that it led into a very creepy moment afterwards was actually very well done so yeah stop getting sidetracked with the fog it's a really good film but i do re I, I do recommend that film it was a film directed by john carpenter of halloween and um the thing fame and I think it's a really good film. It's one of my favourites. It was one of the first ever John Carpenter films I ever saw. So, yeah, I, I would definitely recommend that. But, yeah, this particular episode really does utilise oral storytelling exceptionally well. And the third story is about Posey and um, Pierce's daughter, who Posey sadly lost while she was pregnant during a motorcycle accident. And it's a very sad story, but she also... Um, highlights a moment where 
she was working at a reception desk. She was working at the reception. She was, she was cleaning. She was working as a receptionist somewhere, and she was cleaning. And she just saw her mum, and she had black eye makeup just running down her face, like when you cry, like when you're when, when you've got mascara on and you cry, you can just create these very black lines down your face. And she puts out a hand on the glass, and she just says, "I'm sorry." And um, the the great thing about this particular story is how Shivna Gulati, um, sorry again if I mispronounce the name, um, how she performs it is very well done, and I really do think she's a funny actress. She was in um, she was in shows like Dinner Ladies, and she was also really funny in episodes of Coronation Street sometimes. But when she really carries these very emotional moments, you really do see a lot of heart, and you see a lot of regret and sadness there and I really do love her performance when she's performing this particular monologue and it is a sort of um it is a sort of performance where you do have to have a certain sense of gravitas so the fact that she's literally going working with these heavyweights of you know just a, a commanding performance really goes to show that she's an incredible actress and she really does prove that she can you know deliver these very heartfelt speeches and do it in a way that really feels genuine and makes you feel really bad for the two main characters but the fact that she kind of repeated the line about the dark mascara running down her mother's face and she repeats it when she um talks about the hospital where she was um she, she was involved in a car accident or a bike accident and she, she basically was in hospital, she lost the baby, and her mother came in, mascara was running down her face, dark, dark lines going down her cheek. And she repeats that detail, she says that detail before, where it runs down her cheek, and then she says it again. And I thought, the repetition of certain details, especially details like that, felt very Grimm's fairy tale esque where they would often repeat certain details with sort of like a rhyming couplet or some sort of rhythm to it, where it kind of feels like, oh... There's a there's a reason why this detail is ex described or you know given notice in that particular way, and I just thought that was a very interesting detail that Steve Pemberton and Rishi Smith added from a writer's perspective that really just kind of made me think, wow, bravo, <laughs> Rishi Smith and Steve Pemberton, you did a wonderful job in this one. And um, what I really think is important about this particular story is it shows that these characters were kind of meant to serve as kind of these annoying, um, these annoying char characters who just kind of interfere with the main, um, the main characters' duties in the church, which we still don't know by this, uh, but by, by this point in the story. But what's very interesting is that he keeps telling them different stories, like with um the story that he tells Simon Callow's character, he is basically doing it for the for the sake of his dead wife. and he tells the couple, Posey and Pierce, that he's um visiting his dead grandmother and he wants to stay the night in quiet contemplation. And I love how he says those specific words because it doesn't really feel like he's it feels like a very intellectual, very kind of stone cold way of saying, you know, I just want to spend some time in quiet, you know, solitude and, you know, spend time with my loved one who's passed. He doesn't really have any feeling or any emotion in it. So you can tell right away that he's kind of bullshitting the, the couple and he's actually just making this up on the fly. And he really doesn't, we, we, we don't really know as yet why he's there. But then um, he adds a little detail about um, the reliquers or, or people who basically took remains of dead people in order to sell the black market. And he says, he describes, and this was a very interesting detail that I didn't catch until my second time watching it. And I thought it was very interesting that he said, you know, he described it as a very morbid, but very, profit very profitable um, business um, back in the day. I thought that's a very bizarre thing to say because, yes, he could be just saying it from an academic standpoint that, yeah, they charge a lot of money to do this sort of stuff of taking people's remains and selling them. But the way he described it just kind of made me raise my eyebrow, literally, and say, well, hold on a minute, there's something about this particular... Um, the particular phrasing there, Mr Parkway, that made me think, oh, there's something a bit dodgy about that line. And um, the whole entire story with um, with 
Shearsmith and Golati was absolutely wonderfully performed, and I feel like um, it, it was just a really beautifully done scene. But the fact that it really kind of brings context into why Pierce is being so loud and really kind of you know rude and saying all these very you know inappropriate jokes in a church. Uh, it really kind of just adds a sense of oh, you get why he's he, he's being the Joker in this this particular pairing because he wants to. He wants to basically give comfort to his wife who is going through something that no one should ever have to go through, which is the loss of a child. And he, he really does try to do it with a lot of heart. And you really do get a sense of character development and a good a good character shift in that moment where you think these characters are kind of a bit annoying, kind of like Donald and Jacqueline in Benidorm, where they're kind of annoying, but they try to be as friendly as possible. But at the same time, you kind of, you don't really get that redemption arc with um with with Donald and Jacqueline. They are still charming and lovely in Benidorm, but I think what really is interesting about um Post and Pierce is you really do get that moment of vulnerability and you really do get that moment where you see that oh these characters are literally going through their own pain and they're using their very kind of Pierce is using the humour as a coping mechanism will try to cheer his wife up after experiencing something that no other person should have to go through, which is the loss of a child. So I feel like that's something that really is quite wonderfully um, depicted there. And the fact that they literally proceed um, to um, hear a phone call and Pierce picks it up and he goes, who is this? And he goes, oh, it's for you. <laughs> and he hands it to his wife and he just goes, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it really just goes to show I just I just thought yeah I love this couple I really do and um, they start hearing noises they hear the phone call and it doesn't really say anything but what I think is I just want to rewind a little bit she says um, when she's describing the scene of her mother's hand on the glass and scar running down her cheek she says it wasn't a whole Pierce says, what, you saw a ghost? You saw a ghost of your mother? And she goes, no, it was more like a warning. And that plays a very interesting um, play into what happens earlier in the episode when Parkway's in the church alone. He sees a hooded apparition hiding behind a Christmas tree and in one of the pews, like one of the confessional um, booths, and... That immediately puts the, the creeps up anybody and <laughs> they're thinking to themselves, oh my God, there's this creepy apparition that looks a little bit like Santa Claus. And um, what's very interesting is um, they start hearing noises, they hear a phone call and then um, they see a hooded figure <laughs> and they immediately freak out and they leave the church as anyone would and then it's revealed that the person in the hood is in fact Parkway. And Parkway immediately, you know, starts to get to work, you know, deciphering. We then realise that he's actually there for the Bones of St Nicholas, how it ties into the title. And he then goes to hide when he hears that Dick's coming back and he hides up in the rafters to, um, to essentially, you know, escape detection. But then he ends up, you know, discovering where the bones of St. Nicholas are, which is up in one of the rafters of the stone walls. And he takes the bones, but then he ends up tripping and hanging himself. And throughout the course of the episode, we see very strange things happening. Like, say, for example, at the very start of the episode, before he sees the... After he sees the hooded figure in red, he goes up to the tower room where he eventually hangs himself accidentally and he hears gagging noises, almost like he's being... Ch he hears gagging noises from somewhere, from a strange voice. He could have hears gagging noises and he doesn't really know quite where it's coming from. And immediately you can think to yourself, why is there gagging noises? What does this actually mean? What's it supposed to be? And at first, I thought it was literally going to be a story, like a ghost story, that like, oh, St Nicholas is literally, you know... Um, trying to warn people that this evil apparition is the butcher and he's there in the church, you know, trying to hide his his appearance through the, the, the mock, it, the mock, you know, look of the hood. But what's very interesting is that there is no actual ghost and all the apparitions that you've seen throughout the course of the episode was in fact Parkway trying to essentially, you know, oh, hide and commit his 
commit his intended task without being caught. But sadly, or perhaps just deservedly, he ends up, you know, hanging himself accidentally because he's after these bones. And I actually found that very interesting because there's all sorts of other details. Like, say, for example, the apparition hiding in the Christmas behind the Christmas tree. You also see the um, candle blown out. But he just kind of, you know, wafts it with his hand and it just kind of disappears and all these other things. And then you see the uh, the figure in the confessional booth that was actually Parkway, you know, just hiding from Dick. And there's, there's so many good references to that. But then it kind of gives you the impression like, oh, is it literally Parkway trying to warn himself that he's going to die? Or is it literally, you know, St. Nicholas warning Parkway not to do this job because it's very, you know soul destroying it's literally a sin to rape to rob graves and he literally you know isn't taking any notice he isn't taking any you know stock in any of these superstitious stories he just sees them as base of superstition and that's it so it really does give you this interesting idea like is this the ghost of saint nicholas telling parkway to you know leave now and you know go home spend christmas with your, with your family if you indeed have family or is this basically Parkway trying to warn his past self of his fate? And that really gave me Don't Look Now vibes. A lot of people, one reviewer of Unleash of the Ghouls said it reminded him of The Haunting of Hill House. But I I love The Haunting of Hill House as much as the next person. It's one of my favourite shows of all time. But I don't think Steve Pemberton and Reece Shearsmith were um, intentionally evoking The Haunting of Hill House with this particular twist. I feel like it was actually something that they were doing in homage to Don't Look Now because there's a lot of references to um, to clairvoyant visions and visions of the future, visions of past loved ones giving you warnings and um, various other things, psychic visions, for lack of a better word. And um, the topic of children dying tragically is also a theme in Don't Look Now and of course the obvious symbol of Don't Look Now which is the red hooded fi- the hooded figure dressed in red and um, I feel like it's a more Don't, Don't Look Now homage than an actual ripping off of The Haunting of Hill House and I think that particular episode of The Haunting of Hill House if you haven't seen The Haunting of Hill House I would recommend watching the show alone based on the fifth episode, The Bent Neck Lady, which is a fantastic example of really emotional storytelling. And it really is one of those episodes that will leave you absolutely terrified, but then you'll be having a box of tissues at the ready kind of thing. It's one of those great episodes, but I would highly recommend that episode of The Haunting Hill House if you haven't seen it already. I'd recommend the entire series just on that one episode alone. I think it's a fantastic series and it's worth watching. But um, I don't think Steve Pemberton were consciously evoking, you know, The Haunting Hill House. And it wasn't until I actually saw their review of it that I actually thought about the Haunty of Hill House. Like I thought, oh yeah, that's actually that's actually kind of an interesting little thing to do. But I don't think Steve Pemberton would have and Rishi Smith would have intentionally, you know, ripped that show off. I think it mostly is a homage to the film Don't Look Now. And um I think that's a fantastic film as well. If you haven't seen it, it's a fantastic film starring Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie. They play a divorced couple who moved to Venice and they are haunted by apparitions and ghostly sightings of their daughter, who tragically drowned in a pond back in their home in the UK. And it's a good film, it's fantastic. It was written by um, Alan Scott and um, Nicholas Rogue, and it's a fantastic film. It was released in 1973. It's a fantastic movie. I absolutely love it. It's a fantastic movie. It's a great film to watch on repeat viewings, but yeah, I digress. Moving back to The Bones of St. Nicholas. Yeah, this episode was fantastic. It was really funny. It was a great treat for us Inside Number 9 fans, and I really do hope that um, the rest of the series is just as good as this episode, because this was a good opener. I don't think it was as good as The Devil of Christmas, but The Devil of Christmas really just kind of felt like that was a one-time thing. That was lightning in a bottle, and I don't think they'll ever repeat that kind of, you know, shock, um, that, that kind of jolt, that kind of shock ever again. 
in terms of you know suspense or horror but i think what's really interesting is that the that the episode is still really brilliantly done it's well acted it's well written it has a great cast i love the uh the the telling of these ghost stories without any need to incorporate flashbacks or intercutting images of the past like flashbacks into the telling of the story because it just distracts it's, it's kind of like the silence of the labs uh conundrum where you are kind of focused on you want to see the actor perform but then you also want to give the audience something to look at that's like so for example i wanted when i first got started this up and when we first you know went into the new year i got um a chromebook and i wanted to essentially incorporate new techniques into my reviews so you're not just looking at my face and you're not just hearing me talk you're actually you know seeing images like i've thought about incorporating stills or clips from the film or the tv show that i'm talking about in order to kind of you know give you guys something to look at besides my boring face um <laughs> but yeah um i thought about doing that but then i kind of found myself you know re-struggling with the software and wondering how i was going to do it i was going to do it on my chromebook but then i thought because i've linked it up to my phone i might just take the clips from this and just try to you know edit it into the uh into the youtube upload so that i could actually present a much more clearer image of myself talking or, or try to figure out how to use that editing software that i found online to really kind of you know better use it but yeah i, th I think it's um an interesting thing and um would that be as interesting as you know just me talking about it and in terms of my review i don't think this is a very good um example but i think in terms of the performance of the characters in the show it really works to just have the camera stay still and not cut to anything not have any you know preconceived images incorporated into this particular sequence because to me it's just perfect just seeing the actors perform and if you kind of cut away from anything and you try to cut something else like a flashback or something it kind of feels like a little bit of an insult to the actor because they're kind of they're trying to perform this stuff and they're trying to you know really kind of show that this is happening in real time and when you're hearing a story in real time you just have the person's face you don't have images to go along with it yeah you might have your own image painted in your mind about what's going on if the person is a good enough storyteller but what really is interesting is just having that character's reaction and i think this is the main selling point for me and what really made me you know su surprisingly really enjoy this episode and I, and I really could kind have of found myself you know really kind of in invested in everything that's going on and it's a fantastic um device and i think steve hampton and Rishi smith have done it again in terms of a christmas special and I feel like the twist is really wonderfully presented. It's not entirely original, but I do think that they did a very good job in their version of it. And they really did a good job of really kind of giving that sense of shock. Like, oh, that's what it all was. <laughs> like, it really does give you that sense of, I actually do want to watch it again and, you know, notice all the little details and how it all kind of came up. And it gives you all these different theories about what it could potentially be as well. Like I said, is this actually Parkway giving himself these visions or is it, you know, St. Nicholas using his powers of, you know, vigilantism or avengerism, for lack of a better word, to um, to kind of warn Parkway of his evil deeds. Like, don't do this, otherwise you'll end up dead kind of thing. And um, it's, it's very interesting so um, I'm definitely going to give this a very high mark. I'm going to give this a 5 out of 5. I think it's a fantastic episode. It's really funny. It's very, you know, heartfelt. It's very atmospheric. It's very creepy. It's a great Christmas Inside Number 9 episode. And if this is what we're to look forward to with the new series, I literally cannot wait for the new series this year. So it's going to be fantastic. And I want to hear your thoughts. What did you guys think about this episode, The Bones of St. Nicholas? And I just want to say one more thing. Um... In the series of Inside Number 9, they have a little tradition where they place a little, you know, statue of a hare in um, the background of certain shots. Sometimes they'll, you know, use them in silhouette or something like that, or they'll, they'll try to hide a little porcelain stat a little sort of statue of a hare in, um, in a lot of Inside Number 9 episodes. And for those of you who were struggling to find the hare... Um, it was actually featured in the uh, office where 
and Posey and Pierce answer the phone in the darkness of the church. You can just see it in the background behind, or literally in the background behind or between um, Posey and Pierce when they're answering the phone in that particular little chapel room. And that's all I'm going to say. And um, yeah, I hope you have all had a very good Christmas and a very wonderful Happy New Year to everyone and to all of my 16 subscribers. I hope you're all having a wonderful day and all the best and look forward to more reviews very soon. I've been Josh with Whimsical Industry Musings. Take care. Bye bye for now.